Good morning and welcome to Office Hours. This is the show where we answer your technical questions as they relate to media and event production. You can use Mukana, our Q&A system, to ask those questions. You can vote on them and, of course, chat with the community. Go to officehours.global forward slash join to do that. Of course, if you don't want to log in, you can ask your questions seven days a week by going to askofficehours.global. You'll get a simple message form. We'll get that message in the queue and make sure that gets answered. That's how it works. Let's dive into the questions. Courtney, what's our first one? All right. First one comes in from uh, Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona. And he says, when you're in the field, what wired in ears uh, can you recommend for monitoring audio from camera? Normally monitor with the Sony MDR 7506s, but looking for something with a little lower profile. Alex. Uh, it just depends on what you're monitoring for. If, if you're really doing critical monitoring, I think those Sonys are actually a pretty good solution. Um, and you're not going to get anything much smaller if you're really looking for critical audio. So you're really trying to pay attention to what those, you know, what that looks like. Uh, I have to admit, generally, when I'm monitoring from a camera or I'm in the field and, and I just need to get close, <laughs> I'm, I'm using in-ears. I'm using these in-ears usually. I'm not trying to mix a show. I'm just trying to make sure that I get good audio. Um, and I find that the in-ears um, pack better. Um, and I didn't use, used to do that, but I got into the habit of it because I were forgetting. I was forgetting the over the ears because I don't use them very often. I only use them in my studio. And so um, they wouldn't make it into my bag. And so I found that uh, I could get what I needed out of those um, without too much trouble. I still use over the ear, um, you know, variety of different headphones, but none of them are smaller than the Sony's that you're using now. Yeah, that's uh, definitely good advice. Uh, for me, for in-ear monitors, there's uh, various brands that make really good products. Obviously, Sure, Sennheiser, Westone Audio. I'm on a pair of really high-end quintuple driver Westone. These are the Pro X50s. Uh, you didn't say what budget you had, Jack, but um, you know if it's less than four hundred dollars, I would probably consider something like a dual or triple driver IEM from one of those big brands because they will give you very high quality audio as well. Next question. Next question comes in from Paul Wallace uh, out there in uh, well Austin, Texas today. I think he's in Hot Springs. Uh, and here on the panel, comment on the extensive use of drone flyovers and the massive LED screens at the uh, Austin City Limits Festival, which happened uh, the last three nights in Austin. And here's a link. Paul, you wanted to provide a little more context? Yeah, I'll provide a little more context. Uh, there was a lot of drones flying, probably a couple dozen. And uh, on Reddit, on the thread thread that I read there, said there was a ring of drones really high. I think those were the surveillance drones looking at. Over to Courtney, I think we lost. One of those surveillance drones just took out Paul Wallace. Yeah, I no took one, a look at. No one talks about the, the, the drones. So I think, we, I, I we think that's, the, that's the lesson the here. Yeah, no one mentions the drones. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, I was taking a look at some of these. So there was this weird shot here. It looks like a drone shot, but then over here on the left side, it looks like a curtain reflected in a window. And what's this dual leap of sign floating up here? If I start it playing, you see, um, what is this that's static on the right side? I don't know. That seems uh, fairly strange to me um, that uh, it is drones and they're violating all kinds of FAA rules that say you're not allowed to fly over crowds. You're not allowed to fly at night. You're not, not you know, so either they got special, you know, permission. I have a feeling if it's, I have a feeling for a festival like that, they probably got some, uh, some uh, approvals. Yeah. Approval I don't think, the they, I don't think they, 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 I don't think they winged it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so. Well, they could, it's night. It's hard to see those drones at night if you don't have lights on them, you know. But when, you, when they, you're putting them into the broadcast, it's harder, harder to hide them. They had a ring of drones really high up for surveillance. And then they had drones that were part of the production that actually went up right to the performer and then zoomed way out and showed the whole Austin cityscape. You can see that in some of the other screen captures I did, Courtney. Yeah, they look pretty amazing. They uh, also, um, did you ever see them on other cameras so you could see how big the drone was that they were flying? Was it little yeah, drone? it was real small and it would look like a DJI and it looked like it had guards around it, you know, like the maybe, guarded type. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was one of those, the new... Uh, yeah, if it was under that weight limit, they'd, they'd, they'd be able to do it. Yeah, yeah, 130 gram. 
No. The Neo? The Neo. Next question. Yeah. That was maybe a Neo. All right. They went question. right up to the performer. And the performer w went over to the drone and was, was playing to the drone. And they were showing that on the video feed. And then it would just quickly go way, way out and way high so you could see the whole scene. And they, there were three massive LED screens on one stage and all the other other uh, venues, there were six of them. They all had giant LED screens. Was this at Zilker Park? Where was Zilker it? Park, yeah. yeah. Okay. With the city as the backdrop, it was spectacular. You can see that in the screen captures I did there if you look through them. There were some that, that one of them had, they even started shooting off fireworks from the from the river. So it was like a phenomenal display of LED screens, drones, fireworks, just all everything, all going at once. Austin City Very Limits cool. has gotten a lot bigger than when I was there. <laughs> Go ahead, Gordon, a, next question. Okay. Next question comes in from Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California. Meta hasn't publicly released... Uh, movie gen yet but it can edit existing footage and add things that didn't exist uh will this lead to b-roll generators in uh in the major editing systems there's a link there oh, AI you know for smaller budget things it could it could also be great for for uh you know i think that for pitches this is where ai is really taking off um being able to do pitches um and, and being able to push stuff together that gets people to imagine what you're doing and for smaller budget things, um, I think it, it, it could work uh, somewhere in the future. Um, it's The thing about AI is that you look at the images and they look so pretty. Um, and they, they come out and you go, this is going to take over the world. But they can't take any direct direction <laughs> like like in, in at the level that feature films require. So, you know, we're talking about weird little things about the details or something over in the corner or a little glint that goes over something. And, and it's just not... You, you, AI just, you know, you ask it for this one little change and it changes a whole bunch of other things as well. Or it doesn't, you, you ask it like six times and it does something that six times isn't exactly what you wanted. And directors expect to get exactly what they asked for. So so I think that, um, I, I don't think that it is, it, you know, and again, it, it might, you say, may, say the Hong Kong or whatever, maybe it puts in a couple things and that kind of look like Hong Kong. But a lot of times um, it's not going to be quite what you wanted. So for major feature films, it probably wouldn't be. I can see, you know, million dollar films, half million dollar films, people throwing those things together. And maybe somewhere in the future, you, you'd be able to do that. But I don't think it's as close as everyone thinks it is. Um, there's a huge gap, not in quality of how it looks, but in, um, but in whether it can actually be used and intercut with other things. It's, there's a huge gap that's still there. Jeffrey. So uh, programs like Opus Clip already have B-roll generators to them. And with that, the, it, it really doesn't work that well uh, in there. But uh, with, uh, with Meta, I wouldn't guess that you're, you're putting in more prompts, you're putting in more information. Uh, but still, you're, what, as Alex said, you're still not getting exactly what you're looking for. So I, I think this is at least three to four years out. Courtney? And with, uh, I think it could be useful for previs and for doing uh, temporary set extensions to let people know if it has good with uh, a generative fill to, you know, we've already seen it happen on, on flat uh, images to extend out uh, either side, make up stuff that goes on either side. So if it sees part of a set where, you know, you're going to do uh, CGI set extensions up for a camera tilt up or something that something that isn't there, you see studio lights. Uh, it might be good as a stand-in for that until the real CGI is done. Uh, give everybody, you know, a handle on what could be there, what would be there, as long as it's accurate. Rick? Yeah, I, you know, <clears throat> I have mixed feelings on this because things are progressing so quickly. Um, there are some interesting features like, like Premiere, Adobe is going to have a feature in Premiere that you can extend a clip, you know, extend a duration for a little bit longer. Um, you know, things like Runway and I want to say Kling have an extension feature too, where you can extend a clip so many seconds. Uh, you can give it some text prompts that help guide it, but it is then again, it's, you know, it's still the AI kind of dreaming up what it's going to be. So for now, it is still kind of, 
you're up to the um, AI to decide what that extension is going to look like. But the way things are progressing, I'm, I'm not too sure how long it's going to take to get to that point. Um, but yeah, it's still a progression. Go ahead, uh, Alex. Yeah, I just think there's a, there's a lot of money being raised on telling everyone that it's going to replace Hollywood, and there's a lot of people that are upset with it, replace, you know, that it's going to replace Hollywood as a previous tool and as a, this is what the movie could look like. I think it's going to be amazing, and we're going to use it a lot, and a lot of people, it's going to change how we pitch movies. I just don't think, like, you look at how many movies are done by humans that had millions or hundreds of millions of dollars spent and no one goes to watch them. It, it, the, the, er, the margin for error for a movie to do well, for, co- for this kind of thing to do well, is so small that I just think that it's going to take a long time before AI can actually do um, a lot of the work that we would think of. Now, that said, there is a lot of bad shots in films. Like, you, you, there, there's shots you look in the film and you're like, oh, didn't turn out very well today. <laughs> you know, like that was so so I think that there are some in some cases where you could start to have it have it fill in a couple of these shots that might be better than what they shot. Um you know, we might see sprinkling of this and then there'll be a bunch of PR about the sprinkling of there's like three shots in Avengers that were that used AI or something like that. And um and then we'll have another strike and then you know then we won't have any more movies. Um so so the so I but I I think that we um uh, I, I just think that this is much further away from actual filmmaking than we think it is. I think it's it's right there. I do. I'm using AI for previs, for shows and and uh, stuff right now, like every day. So it's definitely for previs and for and for specking things. It's it's incredible. I just don't know if it's ready for um, the real, you know, the the the, the main show. Yeah, and my personal feelings aside, I haven't tested it yet, but I know Opus Pro, which is a very popular tool that many of us have used for generating short-form content from longer-form content, they've introduced a while back, they introduced a B-roll feature where it'll generate B-roll. And I think for, it's not necessarily something I'd want to see be used in movies, but I think for a lot of podcasts and online content creation, you know, it could be a very useful tool for stuff like that. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, it would get a lot more pushback in the movie industry about using tools like this. But like Alex said, for previs and stuff like that, could be a very handy productivity tool for sure. May open up or spark some creativity about the direction that you want to take with 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 things for sure. Next question. Sorry, third time's the charm, clicking that mic button. Douglas Carmichael uh, asked the question, with Mac OS Sequoia 15.0.1 released, has anyone been brave enough to uh, migrate to it? Tony. Yes, I have. Uh, I have uh, I have three computers. I have a Mac Mini M1. Well, I have two Mac Mini M1s, and I have a MacBook Pro M1 Pro, MacBook Pro, uh, the laptop, and the primary M1, I use, I do the latest update, but I have a dedicated machine to conversation with Tony Mobley. That machine <laughs> does not get any updates. It is uh, several generations old, but the new ones uh, the the newer uh, primary machines I do use, I do update. Alex, really looking forward to updating my main machine in March uh, of next year, uh, but uh, I'll have one updated by the end of this week. Now that'll be just my presentation machine, just because I want to see HDR in Keynote. <laughs> That's the only reason I'm going to update it is is to see what that looks like. Asma, yeah, like Tony, I have a few machines as well so my, both my this machine that I'm in meeting now is the latest Sequoia but the other machine production machine it's still still on Sonoma but I uh, haven't found any issues yet with most of the apps that I use so touch wood yeah and I think that's important uh, distinction between production machines and kind of everyday work computer where you're already running a lot of native Apple apps that have been updated. Obviously, Logic Pro and uh, Final Cut and everything like that are going to be stable. But with production stuff, with third-party pro-level apps, you really have to be careful. And I always like to stay about a year or so behind. Sounds like Alex Lindsay is going to be doing that too, uh, just to make sure that things are patched and 
uh, you know, core audio stable, those kinds of essential things that basically are the underbelly of every single thing that you do every day. Alex, you had another thought there? Yeah, and and I it, a lot of this isn't one of the reasons to update is, as you touched on isn't so much whether Apple's ready or not. It's whether all the developers are ready. When there's a lot of changes, you want to give the developers time to settle their their apps and settle their processes. So it's not just the thing about whether Apple has it as smooth as it could be. It's really everybody else adjusting. Yeah, exactly. Next question. Next question comes in from South Africa and Cape Town from Hasmat Gajar, who's here on the panel today. It says, I played with Zoom Tiles and in production, both Zoom ISO and Tiles client from the same host machine. This is this a good idea? What could go wrong? Alex, what could go wrong? Uh, I, I would not run both of those at the same time. I'm t you know, I think Tiles, especially as you start to extend what it's doing, um, is going to put a lot more pressure on the machine, and that is definitely going to affect... Uh, everything down. I mean, while Zoom ISO is very light and Tiles is very uh, light, I I definitely would not put those on the on the same machine. Hasma, well, everything did go wrong. So, oh, it did. I, it did. It ran. Out, you ran out of processing. <laughs> <problem>. <laughs> no, not processing. But I, I I couldn't troubleshoot what the issue was. I have a later question as well. So I had a uh, pilot uh, production on Saturday with 80 doctors online. And uh, it's like automation, you know, what could go wrong? Just about everything went wrong. So I wasn't quite sure <laughs> what the issue of running all what, what, the- when you, said, when you said everything went wrong, what, what is everything? Okay, so when I started the meeting, uh, I lost the video going out to the program, which is related to a question down there. Uh, my uh, companion wouldn't populate some of the names from the gallery. Um, I had H2R graphics running as well with tiles and my Zoom ISO lost the Zoom controls. So I didn't have any of the controls in the Zoom window. So that's well, why and I, I think everything went wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the issue is, is that in addition to putting a lot of pressure on the machine, you're now creating a giant single point of failure. So, you know, and, and I'm a big fan of, um, that's why I have so many Mac minis, is a lot of times I'm not buying big expensive Mac Studios or Mac Pros. I'm just stacking Mac, Mac minis up, you know, to solve those problems so that each one has its own mission. And then they all come together as, as needed. Yeah, I, if my, my production machine is a Mac Studio, and I'm not really sure if it's an overkill. I should rather have, as you say, other Mac. But even I have a Mac Studio. That's my main machine. But I'm still mm -hmm. using. I'm still have other things that are contributing to it. Like I would definitely right. have a Mac Mini or Mac Mini Studio uh, Pro or whatever doing the the tiles. I'd have another one doing um, potentially doing Zoom ISO. It depends on where you're doing production. What are you are sure. you cutting? Are you cutting with an ATEM or? Or ATEM, something else. ATEM. ATEM. So, ATEM. so I'd have yeah. another Mac Mini serving up the SDI signals or HDMI signals to the to the ATEM. So you'd mm -hmm. have those. I would start. I would separate those two out definitely. Um, and again, this comes down to uh, things working because it's not it's not just the the CPU. It's, it also at some point becomes the bandwidth, um, traffic. You know, there's so many things that that could be going on there that I think would be problematic. Gotcha. Next question. Next one comes in from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Uh, what uh, uses in production do you see for the Tilta Hydra Alien Mini compact shock absorbing arm compatible with smaller cameras and car mounted or handheld? Alex? Well, I, you know, you always have to be careful of putting um, uh, your phone or other things onto your onto your car ask me how i know uh but but you uh, oftentimes the suction cup will not come off but the but it does uh sometimes the mounts themselves can tear apart these actually look like fairly um strong mounts now the ones that that i see on the website here are really look like they're designed for some of the smaller cameras i don't think they're designed for necessarily phones uh, it looks like gopros and and dji's and um those types of things but it it is a um, you know, basically what this is, is a stabilizer. So it's going to keep it from bouncing up and down. Um, and it's going to, so uh, combined with the stabilizer there, um, it could be, and it could, I don't know whether it lets you lock it or not, but 
what that allows you to do is, of course, put an arm on your on your car that's going to help you get those car shots. And that, that can be a point of view. So you're pointing it outward. You can also turn it in. Um, but most of the time when we use these kinds of arms, uh, we're pointed uh, either outward or through one of the windows um, to grab that. But I think that it's, I wouldn't necessarily... I like things to be a little closer to the car. Like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna do anything that at, at any speed, uh, typically it's gonna be usually three cu suction cups with a with a rig that's gonna really make the camera part of the car. Um, you know, three, four, sometimes more uh, suction cups depending on where you're putting. Sometimes you end up going kind of around the corner um, to grab those uh, those camera shots. But uh, it could be a really interesting one to get some really those kind of Miami Vice type shots as well, where you can really hang a camera wherever you want to put it. Courtney. Yeah, I would say if you're going to be, you know, jumping the car over little ramps or something, this might not be a good idea. But it's so lightweight. And they show it here with a, a little cage for holding an iPhone. And it comes in desert beige and forest green. Uh, so it matches the color of your iPhone. And uh, and there's uh, using a uh, Osmo Pocket. Uh, so that's not a lot of weight. They're sticking on the end of that arm and it doesn't seem, it just seems to be, have this uh, spring arm in here, kind of like a steady cam arm for taking out, as Alex said, the vertical bounce only up and down. So it doesn't do any kind of, uh, horizon stabilization or pan tilt or anything else. So it's just to take the bounce out if you're going over a bumpy road, maybe. Uh, and there's a lot of electronic image stabilizations that can pull that out you know, extra smooth, that that electronic image stabiliz stabilizers that can do that anyway. The suction cup looks uh, pretty pretty hefty, so I think uh, I might trust it if it's on a windshield or something that has a non-porous surface on it, but uh, I'm not sure how much it costs it's from Red Shark. Next question. Next one comes in from uh, Dirk Brewer in Guatemala. He says, I'm planning on upgrading to Sequoia Mac OS using a clean install method. How would you save all your applications, particular preference settings, et cetera, instead of writing down your current settings or a screen capturing or screen capturing them? Alex? I have to admit that I, I, I don't usually do very much of that. Um, most of the time what I do is, is I, I'm walking away from that computer and I'm rethinking everything that I'm doing. I use it as a, a once a year kind of just, I'm going to put everything aside. I'm going to put something new on the computer and I readjust those preferences as needed. So I don't, I don't have, and, and I will admit that on any given day, I don't use, I don't use that many complex apps that have uh, really complex preferences that I've changed. Um, but usually I, you know, if there's a certain, uh, is there, if there's a certain couple things that I need to remember to do, I, I will. But a lot of times I just rethink things um, as I, as I go through it and I reset them. And it's, it's a good thing to do once a year, <laughs> you know, is to, when you do the upgrade. Yeah. Every time I do a clean OS install, I know there's, there's only a small handful of settings. Like uh, there's certain things that I like in terms of the way uh, things are set up visually like I like having the three column layout and finder and there's a few tweaks that I make but I, I kind of know I've been doing this for so many years now that I just I know what tweaks I need to make inside of system preferences and how I want my desktop laid out that I don't really need to I don't find a need to clone anything or make documentation about how I've got things set up so I think once you do that enough times you kind of just know how you want to to have it uh, set up and and personally i'm not a huge fan of also cloning machines and then and then cl taking that clone and moving it to another computer that has different hardware i just the the reinstall process is so simple nowadays and it takes especially if you have good bandwidth it doesn't really take all that much time and i think cloning does make sense in certain environments where you've got enterprise uh level computers you're dealing with and you've got a whole fleet of computers then that's a different story you need to figure out a way to deploy all that stuff easily but for home stuff for for me with just a few computers uh, it's fine next question next question comes from Mahasma Gajar in uh, Cape Town South Africa is there a reason why video in program will not show ATEM Extreme multi-view shows video zoom camera is on uh, but no video into program zoom ISO client Hmm. Alex. So, so Hasmuk, well, let's dig into this a little bit. So, <laughs> uh, so, so you have, you had Zoom ISO sending 
um, not an ISO individual, but active speaker or something out to the switcher? What was what was being sent to the switcher? Well, the the, the, the ca- obviously the switcher had all the cameras, including the, the the primary camera facing the talent, and Zoom ISO was the main host uh, meeting client. And uh, I could see the uh, video, the uh, camera on talent in the multi-view. But in program out in multi-view, I couldn't see the camera just wouldn't come on. And, and, and I just want to, uh, so you're talking about the UVC out or are you talking about the, are you talking about the, the webcam out, the, the, the USB the out? Or, so you could see the program from a, from the, is it, are you using SDI or HDI, HDMI? Uh, HDMI. So out of the HDMI, you could see program. Mm. Yes, correct. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, out of the H- HDMI, uh, let's say the HDMI number two was the talent camera. And in, in multi-view, I couldn't see that cam- when I switched to program, uh, that means in Zoom ISO, when I switched on the camera to go out now into the meeting, into program, the video wouldn't come out on on program. Everything else would come on program. That means my graphics would come on. Uh, anything else I switched from the ATM would come on to the program, including let's say the slide machine. But the no, camera. Right, but I just want to. I just want to mm-hmm. separate this out just a little bit because I'm, I'm. I'm. I think that I just want to make sure our nomenclature is correct because it's yes important. The, um, the uh, so. Your what you're looking at that isn't coming out. Does the HDMI? Because okay, with HDMI, you didn't have a you. All you had is multi view, and then you had one camera, one one a return back to the guest. Is that is that what that's what the t- you were using those two outputs for? The the outputs was going one was going to a prompter and uh, and, right. and something else, but the the. The camera in program in the Zoom meeting itself wouldn't show the camera. Right, but but what I, I get so the but in the multi view you saw the program. I saw program, but not the camera. So even if I switched on the ATEM, any of the inputs, all the other inputs I could see in program. Could you but see preview? Not the no, no, not not preview. It's just straight cut. Oh, you're not doing preview and cut. You're doing straight no. cut. Yeah, yeah. Why, why, why would you do do that? Like, why that's would you? Another, <laughs> that's another discussion. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I would. People do it for sports. I've seen it done. I've never seen it yes. done for non-sports events um, because it's really dangerous. You know, like it's it's a really like do, doing not you know. Cuts only is, I can't live that way. <laughs> like I can't, life's too short. So, so the, um, uh, so, so I guess the, um, so I, I wouldn't do cuts only. I, that'd be one thing that I would get away from pretty quickly. Um, and uh, again, for sports, sometimes it's really fast. And, but man, it's really great to see a preview of, of what you're about to cut to. Um, sure. The, uh, the, it, do you know of all of so then and then when you you said when you ran graphics you saw the graphics? Yeah, in so I, in the ATM with the eight inputs, I had eight HDMI inputs. All the other inputs will show up on program except the camera. All the other inputs. So that and this is the camera. Um, the camera is, that we were using as the webcam for and that's the a black, meeting. And that's a black, black magic ma- camera? Magic pocket cinema camera. The way I resolved it was to restart the ATEM and restart the client. And then everything came back. Yeah, because I think that the, the question I have is, so by the way, um, I love my ATEM Extreme that I have on my desk. I have definitely decided that I can't use it in production. Like I can't use the, and, and it really has the output problem. It's that I, the, what you're dancing with a little bit there is two outputs in my opinion is not enough to do a production. You know, and as soon as you start having a lot of people involved, I would highly recommend, you know, thinking about at least, I just did a production with the, 
the SDI version of this one and having the, and I filled up those four outputs really quickly <laughs> and I still wish I had more. I probably, if I did that show again, I'd probably just use a 2ME, one, one U 2ME Constellation HD or whatever, because it just, it, it, it is having all that IO, you will fill that IO, no matter how much IO you have, you will fill it up. Um, and, and I think that it really makes a, I mean, when you're putting a lot of effort into something, the difference in cost between a 2ME, I mean, I, I, it took me a while to come around to this, but I, I mean, and I played with it in a lot of different ways. I just don't think HDMI is a production platform. You know, like I just don't, like I, I've done a bunch of things in and out with it, but, you know, I really think that SD, I would really consider an SDI pipeline for, for what you're doing. You know, just, just think, I would think about that. If you're starting, you're, you're doing serious things with a lot of people that, have limited amount of time, um, you know, and, and I, it feels like the stuff isn't quite, it's probably much more advanced than anything they've ever seen, but it isn't, <laughs> when I start having this many people involved, um, I'd start thinking about a, probably a little bit more, more heft in the, in the back end, you know, be something I'd consider. May I ask, the ATEM Extreme Outputs, uh, they they not in the meeting. They used for display like a, a, a multi one is multi view and the other one is going to the prompter from the HDMI. Out. And then you still have two more. Then you have program and you have and the reason that that's important is that you can start looking at you you, you can have a full program full like so and mm -hmm. and for instance I I recorded I, I was doing something where I recorded my show the show that I was cutting my ISO records you know for a variety of reasons weren't perfect. I still have an edit, <laughs> you know, like that of, of the show, you know, and and so having those, you know, those extra outputs. Um, and what happens is, is that you start sending those outputs other places, and once you go into an STI environment, you also start to uh, have, you know, you start ser serving up a lot more monitors, serving up backup records, serving up, you know, you have extra things that are going on. I can tell you that I, I you know, because I've been trying to figure out how to go smaller. Like that's been my experiment. Like how do I not bring a truck to everything? So I, you know, I kind of have been trying to go into smaller things, but I think that, again, as a home production system, I think that this, I mean, I'm on the border of, of even not, not using this for home production, but, but I'm close, you know, it's, it's close um, for the extreme HDMI, but I just don't think I would use it for uh, production. We just convert all our cameras with the bi-directionals, you know, and they all, you know, and, and call it a day as opposed to, um, uh, you know, for the for the for the black magic ones, but I, I just don't know if I would um, depend on HDMI once I started inc incorporating a lot of people, you know, into the into the process. Something to think about. But I think that it sounds like what you really had trouble with is the UVC connection to the computer, and it does sound like restarting it. But it also sounds like you've got a lot going on on one computer, and I think that a lot of these problems will go away when you replace or not or add to that one computer two or three other Mac minis that are taking away a lot of the stuff. I think a lot of things are asking for resources, asking for inputs, asking for, um, you know, CPU power, asking for bus, you know, buses. There's a lot of things going on in that computer. And I think that that's the, I think that's a big challenge, you know, where it's going to be hard to, it's, it's going to be hard to do, build a reliable system with, without more, more computers. And they don't have to be big computers. I probably wait, another three or four weeks if you can only because we're about to get a bunch of new mac minis but but if you can't if you have a show next week then you're gonna buy what you need to buy courtney you had some troubleshooting uh, suggestions uh, yeah a couple of questions uh this could be a frame synchronizer issue uh because some monitors i was going to ask you how's my uh did you take you had the two hdmi outputs one had the multi-view on it and that was fine that that one camera showed up in the multi-view okay uh, no, and no, it didn't no, show up in the multi view. Didn't show up in the multi view. Oh, That's the I point. thought you said what? it did show up. In the multi -view. No, it didn't what? show up in the multi view. I mean, on the multi view, I was watching obviously the program in the multi view, and the camera. Well, on the multi view, you show. see all of the all of the images, right? All your inputs and your preview and program. Yeah, I can, you can see all the HDMI inputs on the okay. multi view, and uh -huh. you also see program. Right, because you had it in direct switch. You didn't have yeah. pre in preview mode. So, so you just see yeah. one big big window of and, program. Out, yeah. and the little windows, uh, That's the windows right. down below. Correct. 
So you it. did see that camera that's coming in that is not showing up on the out, on the U, on the UVC output uh, in the multi view. Yeah, so and in, in the, the other HDMI output that you were feeding to the teleprompter, uh, did you try swapping them and putting the multi view? No, I didn't. I did not. Okay. I and did not. Uh, I was wondering if it could be frame rate. And also, there was new software, you know, recent update to the software for mm -hmm. the, the switchers added the ability to change the uh, uh, USB output to be any of the inputs. As opposed to just preview or program, just program. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, did you have the latest firmware installed? Yeah, I, I did, I did. Okay. Now, well, maybe you're running into a frame rate issue with that new firmware since it's so fresh. Maybe they didn't. If it if it's coming in, if you're in direct cut instead of uh, preview. preview program, maybe the frame synchronizer doesn't work, and that camera was putting out uh, 1080. 60p instead of 1080 30p mm -hmm. uh, and that the um, the UVC output couldn't handle the 60p that could be the problem uh, could be a what, bug in what, the, what input were you what's the camera plugged into yeah that's a good question uh, you mean in the one that wasn't showing up yeah. what 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 cam what input was the camera plugged into on the ATM one no, number two. I, I don't okay. use number one. one. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure. You see us I'm, go after one. What is like, a weird, I, weird I, input? I'm an I'm a OG. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, one. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, so that that was something I was kind of going after. But but I, I do think that uh, it does sound like a synchronizer, some kind of synchronizer problem. But, uh, you know, again, my temptation is exactly what you did, which is I restart things pretty quickly. Like if things aren't... Um, aren't, aren't what I expect. Now, did you were yeah? So, but good, good. Yeah, luck. and to bring in the chat too, Guy Cochran was saying if key one was left on accidentally, then that could you could just get um, you could just get black. And of course, if the st the safe state wasn't uh, turned on, if you restarted, it would have it would restart with the key off. That may be the closest truth. I suspect. Yeah, definitely one thing to do is always, if, if you're not seeing something coming out, turn all your, make sure all your keys are off because it, yeah. it, it's really easy to have a key set with a little too high of a, a little too low of a gain, a little too high of a whatever, and suddenly it's just knocking out your, your program. And again, you would notice this more clearly if you were using preview program instead of cuts only. <laughs> this would be much clearer. Like, you'd be able to see it really fast. You know, cuts only is a... It's a super dangerous way to work, in my opinion. Like, I, you know, like I would never, never do that, ever. I've never done a show with cuts only. I've seen it done. I've heard people talk about it. Um, but I would never do a production with cuts only. I guess I love dangerously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. So anyway. All right. Well, I hope that uh, sends you in the right direction, Hasmuk. Uh, please report back if you, if you get any new results. Next question. Next one comes in from Guy Cochran uh, in Seattle in the USA. He says, can the Bird Dog NDI PTZ control iOS and Android app both monitor and control other manufacturers' PTZ cameras or NDI devices? Note it just uh, became free. And he has a link there. Could this be a Cochran? No, he's not here. To, yeah, I was just going to say, I wish he was on the panel because I bet he'd be showing the app right now. I haven't actually, I'm not, I'm not a PTZ person, but that's cool that it became a, a free app. Is any, anybody else here using PTZ cameras maybe that can comment on that? I don't know. Well, you, you also have to use uh, P PTZs and NDI, <laughs> so uh, both both together. But um, I think it's it's great that these apps are available. I still I'm still get, trying to get around to testing the the new link with the new software that I hear that the phone can control. Um, I think being able to control it with the phone is useful. Uh, I, I think that the uh, I always look at like when when I'm using PTZs, I guess I, I, a lot of times I'm not trying to figure out how to get to a phone. I'm really trying to fine tune. It to how to have it really look like it's a true camera. And I feel like the resolution coming out of these cameras, uh, you know, I, a lot of times I, you know, I, I get excited about an app running on these things, but then I go back to wanting to have hardware that's going to just reliably do what I want. Like a good example is the FR7. It's really cool that I can open up an iPad app, but I'm still going to use an RM500 <laughs> you know, when I actually need to do a production. Uh, you know, and so that's the, I mean, I think that it just a matter of resolution of control, I think becomes complicated. It's not, it's, it's cool to be able to do that, but when you're really looking at 
I don't know, what I would call production production. You you want to have the proper tools in place to to do it. It's just it's really hard to uh yeah, it's it's really easy, I guess, to have it not look complete to clients and partners. And and that's what I, I try to avoid, like the plague. Jeffrey? I think it's a good backup. Uh if you're not running an all bird dog system, then you might run into problems with whatever PTZ camera you're working on, even though it says it supports it. it there's only a, a certain level of support that, that it can do from there. Uh, so I would probably use it. I'd probably use it as a backup. So yeah, let's say I was away from my desk. I couldn't get to the PTZ controls. Uh, remote through a, through a phone is great. The bigger problem is then you got to open up the phone. You've got to find the app. You got to open the app. You got to wait for the connection and then go from there. So uh, most of the times I don't use apps like this on mobile. I want to have more wired connections. Next question. Next one comes in from Tony Mobley in Noonan, Georgia. And here on the panel, he says, is anyone making use of their M series iPad Pro? Uh, I have a concern that mine is not helping my production. It's a consumption device right now. Please help me justify this purchase. Tony. Yeah, um, I originally purchased the M1 Mac, I mean, iPad Pro, um, one gigabyte, um, I'm sorry, one terabyte, um, to use as a media device for the house of worship. And I don't know if you guys remember, probably um, two years ago, I was constantly asking questions about the issues that I was having with the iPad in terms of it being in part of my setup just could not get it to work in my setup. And what I've deduced is basically it's the fact that the iPad has the Thunderbolt connection and it just was not uh, working with the adapter that I was using. So I started using um, 11 inch iPad Pro, um, the generation before, and I have no issues with media for the house of worship. Um, but this iPad that I have, you know, that costs so much money, I'm not doing anything with it in re in relations to uh, conversations with Tony Mobley, house of worship. You know, I'm basically just carrying around checking emails, watching movies, playing a few games, reading articles. And, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. So um, I, I considered a M4 uh, I, um, MacBook um, iPad Pro, and I was like, you're not doing anything with the M1. So help me make sense of this, this road that I went down. Yeah, Alex, go ahead. I, I wrestle with the same thing. I have two of the Mac, uh, the, the iPad Pros, and I use them heavily. But as you said, I don't, I don't know if I push them that hard that often. Um, I do think that there is, and I don't know whether it's generational or other things, but the touch interface, if using a touch interface with things like I want to use Resolve and I want to use Logic and I want to use a lot of things, but I find myself fiddling with them for just a little while before I end up back on my desktop. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, it, the, the screen is very constrained. The controls are, you know, clunky um, for the higher performance uh, tools. And so I, I think that I, I have a, uh, I have even a hard time, like I've been looking at my next iPad, you know, um, or, or like I'm my, like my daughter may end up using my, one of my iPad pro, pros because she actually wants to record a bunch of music into Logic and I can plug it in and she'll, she's much more, she's been using an iPad since she was two. <laughs> so, so she's, so she, you know, her uh, fluidity uh, may be a little bit better. But I think that, um, again, I, I think that I'm, my next purchase may even be just an iPad Air, which I haven't done. I've gotten the pro version of the iPads since they were released. But the iPad Air, I looked at, I was like, oh, it kind of does everything that I want it to do. Um, it is, uh, I, what I'm really interested in, I have to admit, is the next generation pencil and that control of it. And I thought I was going to have to get an iPad Pro for that, but it looks like all those tools are available in the iPad Air. Um, and so I, I, I've been kind of leaning more into getting an iPad Air because it's a lot less expensive. 
Um, but I think that that's, uh, I, I haven't had as the same interface problems or ones that I didn't expect. But I, but I do, I, I have looked at it. It's funny that you asked this question because I was thinking about it over the weekend about how little, how, how I don't push my iPads very hard. And I think Apple's very much wants to find ways to push your iPad hard. I just think they haven't been very good. I mean, it's just, it's just hard to get something that pushes it hard that also uh, works on an iPad. Like, and I think that's the challenge. I just, I, next, I, just got my, I just got my wife the, um, the Air, the yeah. new Air. And she's very happy with it. She had a pro, um, uh, 2019, I want to say. And it was a, you know, it was a great machine and it still worked, but I upgraded her to the, the M2 Air that just came out. And she's very happy with it. It was a lot less than the iPad Pro. So uh, yeah. it, was, it was a good, good route to go for us. I think next level for production on an iPad is uh, an app like LumaFusion, which I bought when it last went on sale. And I haven't actually really played around with it yet, but we had them on the show a little while back. And that looks like an incredibly powerful uh, application for for editing video. And I don't know if it supports Apple Pencil, but I think that would be a good good excuse if you want to play with something that's pro levels to try editing video inside of LumaFusion on your iPad because it looks like a very full feature. I mean, to me, it looks like Resolve in terms of capability, but it's it's on an iPad, so. I mean, I, I, I think that if mm -hmm. if Apple supported, if the if the iPad supported things like the ATEM plugged into it or whatever, you know, and it was an iPad Pro thing, then that'd be obvious for me, like to, to jump to that. It's just that there's a couple limitations to the, to the media IO that has kept me from using the iPad at a level that, I probably would use otherwise. Yeah, exactly. Next question. Next one comes in from Robert Green in Los Angeles. He says, hello, expensive friends. Amazon is having its big uh, sale this week. Uh, it's big prime sale. What's on your radar for a discount besides the usual Amazon devices? Jeffrey. So, yeah, this is Amazon's big deal day. It's the only way that you can get to be part of big deal days is you got to be an Amazon member. Uh, so, but uh, the, a lot of consumer stuff that I saw, I haven't seen anything big. I've seen a couple companies try to latch on to big deal days by saying, if you go over to our website, you'll get some deals, nothing in the AV area. Uh, if you're looking for a laptop, uh, we're talking about tablets, you're looking for a tablet, it doesn't have to be an iPad, but because like, for instance, these Android tablets are perfect. If you've got an X32 and you've got bandmates that don't take, uh, don't take tablets, you can put software on and then they can, uh, they can monitor their own in-ear systems from there. Uh, like this one, this is the Tab A8. I got it last year at like a 30% discount. And I think it's also going to be on this year as well, even less than last year. Uh, doorbells and, and other video cameras like that, uh, video uh, surveillance systems will be there. And uh, head, you know, in-ear headsets if you need something inexpensive. Uh, other than that, I haven't seen anything big uh, for discounts when it comes to cameras or, or anything like that. But then again, things could drop in the next 24 hours. Alex, since we were just talking about iPads, I think Apple just announced or it got out that that I guess there's an iPad, the ninth generation, which is still lightning, uh, is $199. So it's it's I think an 11 inch iPad. So if you're looking for that, I, I my 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 uh, wallet started to smolder when I saw $199 for a, for an iPad, and then I saw lightning. I was like, no, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> I'm not going back to lightning. So, so it's, uh, so I, but it was, it, th there was a little smoke that I was able to, you know, pat out, um, of, of, uh, that, that no, I'm not going to buy two or three of those at $199. If it had USB-C, I probably would. Um, but that's a 40, 40% off, 39% off. You don't see that kind of sale on an Apple very often. So, but that's, that is coming out. Uh, if you need an iPad and you're willing to use lightning. Courtney. Yeah, I, you know, usually stock up on the Amazon products. If you're into the uh, uh, surveillance cameras, all their Blink, uh, the, you know, they bought Blink, and all these Blink cameras are on sale for, you know, 40 to 60% off. So that's a really good deal if you need the surveillance. They even have these wireless ones that are outdoors that run on batteries that last for two years. So you don't have to run any wires to them. That's kind of interesting. But I'm on a WISE system. 
Here's a tablet over here for $74. Alex, look at that. 10 inch. Woo. Even has a USB C on it. And of course it's an Amazon. How well does it how does it run? How well does it how run? How well does it run iOS? iOS? Yeah. Not very good at all. <laughs> but it runs weird. Android just fine. Uh, is it, but is it is that a fire tablet? Or is yeah, that that's a, a fire tablet. The fire tablets are a disaster. Like, like they're not really Android. <laughs> I mean, like we bought them. We were I was excited because they were inexpensive. Um, and we bought them and then we took them all back and bought Samsung's for our, yeah. instead of $79, it, like, we got the Samsung's and, Google on it, but yeah. and put regular Android on it. We couldn't yeah. run anything like the, 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 the fire, oh, they're so bad. Like yeah, it just, their, they're, their play they're, store is only a, a, a fraction of what's available yeah, on uh, Google's, uh, I agree disastrous. with you there. Uh, but if you just want to run a Kindle on it or you want to browse the internet. If you want to run, if you want to run Amazon products on on a fire on a on on one of their fire products, then it's fine. But if yeah. you're not going to do that, it's not fine ever. Indeed, uh, yeah, I was looking for another portable air conditioner because mine back here is is just not putting out really cold air anymore. And so I, I thought, well, you know, Prime Day's coming up. I'll look and they didn't see anything on sale because it's out of season. I went to Home Depot to try and look at what's available. I said, where are your portable uh, air conditioners? Oh, we don't have any. You don't have any? No. Uh, it's off season and we won't have any until it gets hot again. <laughs> so I guess I'm stuck until, uh, cause mine does both heat and cold. So I'm stuck and nothing. I went on Amazon, put one in my basket and it's still at list price. I guess I'm not going to discount it. Jeffrey. It's not impossible that it could get discounted Courtney. So, and if I see something, I will let you know. Thanks. I'll wait till tomorrow and then check again. Next question. Next one comes in from Hosmic here on the panel in Cape Town, South Africa. It says, I'm still using the Blackmagic uh, Pocket Cinema Camera 6K Pro as my webcam. Not used otherwise since uh, another is permanently in the studio. Does this still make sense or is it overkill? Alex. I don't know if I'd say it's overkill. I, I will say that um, having moved to Sony uh, webcams, <laughs> my FX30 being a Sony webcam, my wife having a the ZVE or E10 or whatever, uh, I think it'd be hard for me to go back to the Blackmagic ones as webcams. I just did a show with a bunch of Blackmagic cameras. So it's, I'm still fine with them in production. But I will say that the the lower stress of, fo fo of the focus working uh, is really hard to give up. You know, it, it's really nice to be able to share. I, I have, it's, I've been using so many Sony cameras that when I went to the Black Magic camera and I was able to shade with the with the switcher again, I was like, "Oh, this is really nice." But autofocus is also really nice, and so so I think that that's the the only thing I would think about there is 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 as a webcam um, getting critical focus quickly. Um, it, it is so seamless. Like if you if if I do this and you see how I mean, it looks like a camera operator. Like it's it's just so fast. And I don't see that with any other, I don't see that speed with any other cameras that I use. And as a web camera on some, something that I'm using, I'm using six to eight hours a day. Um, I, I find that the Sonys are a better solution. Now, I will say that in, in high heat, and I would say anything over, I, I wouldn't use the E, the ZV-E10 over 75 degrees uh, ambient temperature. Um, in, in a, in a, I'm just finding that it's not reliable. Uh, even with the even with the insert, uh, even with the the fake battery, the E10 is I don't think now I haven't done E10 version two, but the the original E10 or E ZV E10 yeah E ZV E10 it's very hard to keep track of Sony's nomenclature because they have an E1 or a Z1 or an EV you know they keep on they they, they rearrange the same letters all the time, um, uh, the so I think that um, the FX30 to me is is kind of the entry level of what I would use if I was using it all the time. Um, and, I, and again, I think that having to just stay in focus no matter where, you're, where, you're, where you go or where your operator goes, um, I think is pretty powerful. But if you're not going to go that direction, uh, I think that the, the 6Ks are still very powerful. I mean, they still look great. Um, and it's just, it's just figuring out the focus is the, is the only part that I find challenging. Next question. Next one comes in from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. I uh, said, so preparing for the next hurricane here in central Florida got me wondering, what is the best bet for uh, IP with severe weather and power loss? Thanks. Courtney. Um, well, you know, I would not use satellite as a backup if you're going to have rain-laden cloud cover for any length of time because that 
probably is going to get interrupted as well. Uh, cable and fiber probably are, you know, uh, vulnerable to trees falling on them if they run above the ground. And if they run below the ground, if you're in an area that floods uh, or gets storm surge, you know, the, it can take out some of those as well. I think your best bet is cellular 5G point to point or 5G cellular because the cell towers have battery backups on them. You should have battery backup and your cell phone, something to keep your cell phone charged. And that doesn't take too much battery power for several days. Um, so I think that is going to be your best data connection uh, during a storm because uh, there are multiple cell towers. And unless you know one of them could get knocked down and the others could take up the slack. Uh, of course, everybody's going to be using their cell phone during that time. So expect a lot of traffic if there's a disaster in your area. But that's kind of your best bet for maintaining communications uh, uh, with power outages and uh, inclement weather. Alex, yeah, I mean the the, the best <laughs> the best one is fiber, um, but the question is whether you have that or not, or you have it available to you or not. Um, you know, we've definitely done some stuff where it was hellaciously bad, and we had we had bought spent a lot of money on a fiber connection. Uh, using dark fiber to the venue and we still continue to have a show when no one else did so um so i think that th that that's going to be your best solution anything that's above ground is probably not gonna be a, a great solution for that jeffrey yeah i was gonna say fiber is buried and cable is up in the air uh, i was actually watching uh, uh, cvs i had a nice little segment on yesterday i believe it was where they talked about what they do for the uh, for any type of major disaster and there is and i can't remember the exact name of it it's just basically a a uh, a rule that says that if so if AT&T comes in and sets up a network that they've got to share the network with uh, Verizon with T-Mobile and until that emergency is over there are groups out there that will be setting up emergency uh, systems after the uh, after the event not during the event unfortunately uh, and and future in the future I just read an article on how satellite T-Mobile is going to be working with uh, satellites to get uh, signals so there's going to be multiple options when the cellular signal is down alex yeah and and as mickey pointed out it, it you know the storm itself is very short and then after that you may not have anything um i did saw some news of they're literally air flighting starlings into some of these disaster areas to get them internet so um so i think that you know starlings could make a lot of sense once the storm is passed um, you know, during the storm, I'd probably worry less about IP and more about candles and being somewhere safe, uh, you know, and, and, and taking care of those things. But I think that afterwards, uh, yeah, with very limited uh, uh, electricity connection, connectivity and so on and so forth, I think uh, Starlinks have proven to be a game changer all over the world for in a variety of different environments. Courtney. I was just going to correct one thing real quick is in my neighborhood, AT&T owns the poles. So they run all the AT&T fiber on poles out here in uh, in Hollywood. So uh, check with your neighborhood and find out if there's fiber underground or whether it's on poles. But since AT&T owns a lot of the right of way on poles, they're uh, putting fiber on a lot of poles everywhere. So. Next question. Next one comes in from Gabrielle Jachou, my uh, Miss Yera in uh, Sault Ste. Marie says, Alex, which model headsets are you using? We have all Clearcom here, and that works best with Jans too. And none of them uh, turn off when you lift the mic. We hear them uh, getting brushed into by the band and people's hair all the time. What should we get instead? All right, Alex, do you have any thoughts? The ones that I, the ones that I have are... are uh um, CM 500 or CM 300s. Um, and I believe that they, I, I have to admit, I mostly just felt like they were always automatically off because when I popped it up and I pushed it open back up, no one could hear me. And then I realized I had to bring it back down again. So it may be, I, I have the assumption that it, that it is, uh, that is available, that it's going to turn off when it gets pushed up there. But I don't know that actually for sure. When I looked at your question, I was thinking about it. I was like, well, no one could hear me when I, when I punched in to talk about it, but those are very, very directional mics too. Um, so, but if the CM 300s are the ones uh, for mine are typically double muff and I believe that that's, uh, there, but what I will say is that, um, uh, I would work on building the habit of, of doing it correctly, which is to use the, uh, button. 
Excellent. Well, that wraps up our first hour of Q&A. Make sure you stick around for our second hour. We have a wonderful second hour topic on generating 3D models from text and images that are going to be coming up in just a moment. Just remember, you can get those questions in now, so make sure you put them into Makana and vote on them because that helps us drive the show. We'll be back in a moment with our guest, Rick Markley. See you in a moment.